Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our seventh episode of the UT Southwestern Science Cafe. Tonight's program will shine light on a unique procedure to eliminate cancer developed here at UT Southwestern. This research was developed for the marketplace and commercialization via our Office of Technology Development and is an example of our impact on the North Texas biotech sector. I'm Jenny King, Director of Public Affairs here at UT Southwestern. And on behalf of my public affairs colleague, Corey Tovian, and our guest speaker, Dr. Ron Sumer, thanks for joining us tonight. Science cafes, as you might know, for those of us who are repeat joiners of the program, are online conversations where our speakers take deep dives into science topics. Our format is casual and interactive, and speakers are both UT Southwestern faculty and invited special guests. We encourage you to ask questions and engage with us during the program. We also are going to post the URL to our playlist of past science cafes, and we'll, we will be posting this one there next week. These are always, there are always technical matters to briefly mention in a Zoom meeting, so before we get started, here we go. Check your audio feature now and put it on mute if it isn't already so. This will help with audio clarity for everyone. Just unmute yourself if you are called on to ask a question. We ask for you to utilize the chat feature to list your questions so that we can call on you. And we will do that in the order that they are received during the Q&A portion of the program. And finally, Corey Tovian will be facilitating our Q&A with Dr. Sumer. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Baran Sumer. He is Professor in Chief of the Division of Head and Neck Oncology at UT Southwestern's Department of Odolin... Odolingar... I can't say it. Please say it, Dr. Sumer. Otolaryngology. Thank you. It's not the... Even, it's not. I even have this spelled out phonetically, you guys. A specialist in head and neck cancer surgery and reconstruction, reconstruction Dr. Sumer is also director of the head and neck oncology disease-oriented team at our Simmons Comprehensive Cancer Center, and we are so pleased he is here with us tonight. Dr. Sumer, welcome to Science Cafe, the virtual program and post course. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to talk to everybody. It's kind of a strange format. Um, you know, it's the Zoom format, and I know this is supposed to be informal. I think, you know, we're supposed to pretend we're in a cafe drinking a beer together, but um, it's very tough to do that over Zoom. So I prepared a whole bunch of slides, but please, anybody feel free to interrupt me at any moment, um, you know, as I'm going through these. And then, of course, first question I have is, can you guys even see my slides and my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, so let me try to share my screen. I knew that was going to be a problem. There we go. There we go. Is that working now? That is it's working. All right. Sounds good. All right. So the topic uh, for, for, for my talk today is going to be digitizing biology for surgery. And, you know, I think that that's the broad brushstroke uh, a topic that, that I'd like to talk about, but really what I'm going to be talking about is uh, surgery and, and why I love surgery so much and some of the questions and problems that come up when we're doing surgery, uh, especially oncologic uh, procedures. Um, I do have a bunch of disclosures. I'm a co-founder of a company called Onco Nano, and they have uh, patents that they have licensed from the university. And a lot of the technology that I'll be talking about relates to those patents and then the, um, and the company trying to commercialize these. Um, I do have other disclosures with uh, Intuitive and various other drug companies, but those are not really relevant to this talk, although I'll show you some robotic surgery. And really the story is, is one of a collaboration, um, and it's between me and a whole bunch of people, but mainly um, Professor Jinming Gao, who's a PhD scientist at UT Southwestern. He's actually, you know, next door. We have offices next door to each other, and you know, I don't know if he's still here or not or if he's listening, but... Um, him and I have been working together for about 13 years, and we worked on a lot of different projects together. And our backgrounds couldn't be more dissimilar. He's a polymer chemist. He's a PhD by training. And I'm an MD. I'm a, I'm a surgeon. So I just go to the operating room and see patients. But somewhere along the way, we were able to um, hook up and, and actually um, create some ideas together that will be the basis for this talk. Um, 
I guess the question is, what, what do surgeons do? So this comes up and, you know, in medical school, we have, we have some preconceived notions about all the different people who are going into different specialties. So um, pathologists are kind of known as the doctor's doctor. So when doctors are confused and we are scratching our heads and we don't know what the disease process is, we always go to the pathologist because we know they're the smartest ones and they know all the diseases. They know exactly, you know, uh, all the different differentials that can go into a patient's diagnosis. Um, the medicine doctors are usually very thoughtful. Um, you know, uh, if you guys, you know, watch a lot of doctor shows, all the ER doctors, all the medicine doctors, they're the ones that are, you know, thinking and solving up all the diagnostic dilemmas, sort of like Dr. House in that show um, from a few years ago. The surgeons are like the jocks. Uh, we're kind of stupid and we just like do stuff. So what do surgeons do? We look at stuff. Um, and, and these are all the Greek suffixes that we use for these different procedures that we do. So I do a lot of laryngoscopies. So it ends with an oscopy. So that's usually you're looking at stuff. And then we alter stuff. So we work with our hands and, and that's kind of the jock reference. We, we do synthesis, which is puncturing things. That's another Greek word. Uh, ostomies, we do a lot of tracheostomies, create holes in structures. Um, we pexy things, fix and secure things. We do plasties. But what I do is this, I do removal. I, I take things out and mainly cancer because I'm a cancer surgeon, I'm a head and a cancer surgeon. And that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, but really, I'm not gonna be talking about the action part of things. Um, I wanna show that surgeons can be thoughtful too, maybe not as thoughtful as pathologists or anesthesiologists or medicine doctors, but we actually do spend a lot of time thinking about stuff and we spend a lot of time on this part, the recognition part. And that's what cancer surgery is really all about. And I'll talk about fluorescent surgery and how we can improve the recognition of cancer and contrast that from non-cancerous tissues. Um, and that's what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about, but I, I really want to do a deep dive into recognition. And this gets kind of philosophical in a weird sort of way. So how do you guys know what you're looking at in this picture? It's a, it looks like a very expensive car. I mean, that's the first thing that jumps out of you. When I found this picture on Google, that was the first thing that I thought of. Wow, this is a really nice car. I wish I could, you know, buy one and drive it around. Um, but but how, do, how do we all recognize that so rapidly, so easily, so fast? And, and, you know, the question comes up in oncologic surgery because that's what we're doing. We're trying to recognize the difference between cancer tissue and, and normal tissue. Um, and that's very, very important because if you are not able to do this, if you mistake normal tissue for cancer, you're going to take out a whole bunch of normal stuff that the patient probably wants to keep that's important for their function. Um, for me, that's swallowing function, speech function, the patient's appearance. On the other hand, if you leave cancer behind, then you may set the patient up for a recurrence. So this is absolutely critical. A lot of times we do this by representation. So, so humans are really good at having pictures and maps of things, and this is a PET scan. So what you're seeing here is um, an image where this area that's orange, that's lighting up, that's the tumor. So we can represent where the cancer is, the location of the tumor, um, with some sort of output. In this case, it's FDG. It's, it's this uh, radioactivity that we can detect on a nuclear scan. And then the scan sort of shows up that area as, as an orange blob. And we say, okay, that's where the cancer is. So we get this information uh, on the tumor's location by representing it with something. In this case, this orange color. Um, but this requires not just that you know, information on where the tumor is, but context too. So look at this picture. This is the same exact kind of, kind of scan. This is a PET scan. Um, but the entire you know, brain, I mean, this is the patient's skull right here that I'm kind of tracing out. And here are the eyes. But the entire brain looks like it's lighting up with this orange glow. And then this, this happens to be a patient of mine where they have a head and neck cancer. And there's a tumor here you know, in the neck. This is kind of a coronal view from the front side. You're looking at the patient uh, head on. And you, know, you still see this activity up here in the brain higher up, and then you see this activity here, and, and you say, what's going on? I mean, is, is there cancer everywhere in the, in the patient's brain? And the answer is no. I mean, this scan is based on glucose uptake, and the brain happens to be a, uh, an organ that takes up a lot of glucose. So we just expect this lighting up of the brain on PET scans. And that's why this is not such a useful scan for looking at brain tumors, for example. But when we see this, we're not alarmed because we place it in the larger context of how that scan functions uh, and what we're looking for. And the context is important because when you have context, you really don't need a lot of information. 
So for example, I can put this up here, this picture, and most people, most human beings will say, okay, I don't know what that is, but it looks to me like maybe it's a human face, maybe it's a person. And it's very abstract, right? So this is existing as a thought or an idea. That's the definition of abstract. Um, but we can sort of recognize some features. And then when we you know, give you a little bit more information, less pixelated, a few more shades of gray and, and darkness, you say, hey, wait a minute, I can recognize this, this picture. And it may be a person that I know. And most people can even recognize that image as being the image of Abraham Lincoln, which was one of our presidents. And it doesn't take a lot of data. I mean, you look at, you look at that pixelated image, it's, it's not a lot of information that we're using to jump to Abraham Lincoln. It's just a picture that many, many people have seen over and over again. And we just associate that beard and the hair and the tie and everything else with that particular person. Um, so which gets me to this thought, which is context is an abstract thought. Um, it requires us to create abstraction. So how do we do that? And there's actually two schools of thought for this. So there's the nativists. Um, and, you know, in linguistics, uh, one of the proponents of this is Noam Chomsky from, from MIT, I believe. Uh, and basically, their, their opinion is that abstractions are innate. So our brains are hardwired for this. So just like these ducks that are following their mother, you know, they've imprinted on this. You know, if, you, if, you if you're around ducklings when they hatch, they'll just assume that the first moving object that doesn't try to eat them is their mother, and they'll just kind of follow them around. If that's a person, they'll follow the person around. If it's a dog, they'll follow a the dog around. Most of the time, it happens to be their mom, so they follow their mother around like this until they're grown. And, and this is hardwired into the duck's brain. And, and nativists think that's, that's how humans work. I mean, we have a linguistic center in our brain that is designed to represent language, for example. Um, and that's where all these abstract thoughts, context, et cetera, come from. Um, on the other hand, you have empiricists. And these are philosophers like John Locke. Um, you know, the economist, uh, where basically they say, look, abstractions, all, all these things, these are just an illusion. Everything that we know comes from our experience. And if you haven't seen the color purple, for example, you have no idea what purple is. But once you see it, you know what it is. And if you haven't seen a tree, you have no idea what a tree is. But once someone points that out to you and says, look, that's a tree, um, you know that you, you can recognize that. And anything abstract, anything weird that we're not really used to seeing like a purple tree, it's essentially you just combine the two concepts together, right? You take the purple, you take the tree, you put them together, you have a purple tree, even though probably most of us have never actually seen a purple tree. Um, and and that, that's, that's how human thoughts work. But there's actually a more sophisticated way of looking at how people potentially generate context and potentially generate abstract thought. And this is Bayesian theory. And this is from the Reverend Thomas Bayes, who lived in the um, 18th century, and he actually wrote a paper called An Essay Towards Solving a Problem in the Doctrine of Chances. And basically what he said was that the probability of something is based on our prior knowledge of conditions that might be related to that something. Um, and we update our expectations based on these probabilities. And that this is actually one definition of rational behavior. So one definition of rationality is do we behave in ways that obey the rules of Bayesian decision theory? And this is called Bayesian inference. And it basically specifies how should we update our beliefs when we observe reality? So how do we observe reality and then update what we think of reality? So let's talk about this question. Is a coin fair? So I give you a coin, a quarter, and I say, okay, do you think that this is a fair coin? Meaning it's gonna land 50% of the time heads, 50% of the time hey, tails. So let's start flipping the coin, okay? It lands heads six times and tails zero times. So what do you guys think? A little, seems a little strange, right? That's not what we would have expected, six heads and zero tails. So I'm thinking that, you know, maybe it's not fair. Um, we toss it a few more times and now we get 16 heads and four tails. Okay, we're updating our, our thoughts. So initially I thought there's no way this thing is fair or there's a very, very good chance that it's not. But now I'm thinking, okay, well, we'll see what happens. And we keep tossing the coin, and eventually we get to a point with enough tosses that, look, uh, they're, they're evening out, and maybe you know, that first six coin tosses, that was an aberration. Um, it looks like you know, this, this seems like a reasonable coin, and we're updating our thoughts on how this coin is behaving based on data that we're getting as we flip the coin. And we, we do this as babies. So this is an 
experiment that you can do with very, very young children, infants, and you can have a box and you can start pulling things out of that box. In this case, you know, different colored balls. So you keep pulling these balls out and you see that this lady has pulled out three white, uh, three uh, red balls. And then she goes in, reaches into the box and pulls out a white ball. And then she keeps going and pulls out yet another red ball. And the question is, what do we think is going on inside of that box? And even very, very young children will look at the results when you open up that box and say, you know, that's very unexpected. That's weird. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I was expecting something like this, where the majority of those balls are red based on what we were observing, even though we didn't really observe what was going on inside of that box. So, so here's a question, and this is kind of what I do all day long. This is a, another surgical case. This is a robotic case. Question for this is, where is the cancer? So we talked about context. We talked about image recognition a little bit. Um, we didn't get into fluorescent surgery quite, a, quite yet, but is it here? Could that be the cancer? So this is a patient's throat, just to kind of orient you. Here's an endotracheal tube. That's a breathing tube that's going into the patient's lungs. This is the back of the patient's tongue. And this area, this first area that I outlined is the patient's throat. And right here is their tonsil. So this is the left-hand side. And there's another tonsil over here on the right. And then there's this area, B. And then let's see, C and D. So these are kind of the different areas that I've picked. And I'm going to move this screen out of the way so in case it's in everyone's view so that you guys can sort of see it. All right. I'm going to move these things out of the way so people can vote. I guess I'll vote too. All right. So I'll be, give, you, give everybody a, a few seconds to vote on this. Um, and you can sort of say, look, without context, and most people who aren't head and neck surgeons don't have much context. If you look at this area, um, you know, most of these areas look kind of funny. I mean, this area looks a little funny. That area looks kind of whitish. This area looks kind of funny. And that area looks funny. But there's a hint here, right? So I said there was a base of tongue cancer. And then I told you guys, this is the, the tongue base. So, you know, it, it's likely that based on that clue, you can guess where it is. And it looks like most people did guess correctly that it was this area right here. And that is the tumor right there that I've highlighted in this video. But then the question comes up when you're doing the procedure, how extensive is this? Where else is it going? Is that just the tip of the iceberg? And this is, uh, you know, me doing a, using the robot. These are the arms of the robot to cut into surrounding tissue. And when you cut into the surrounding tissue, you see, areas like this, this little whitish area. And I can tell you when you cut into normal tonsil tissue, including tonsil tissue in the back of the tongue and the sides of the throat, that's what it looks like. Um, but unfortunately for head and neck surgeons, that, that's exactly what cancer looks like as well. So you're looking at that area and it's very, very hard, even for me to tell if that's cancer or if it's not cancer. So it's very possible that this tumor that was here has spread all the way out to this area right there. Um, which is why we use things like PET scans to guide us. And here's the, the, the same patient's PET scan. So you can see that once again, the orange area highlights where the tumor is. And in this case, just to orient you, this is the patient's chin. This is the back of their head and their spine. And this is their tongue. And you can sort of see that this orangish area is in the left side of the back of the tongue. And imagine this, this is all flipped upside down. That's why it says R here for right. And this is the left-hand side but it looks like the tumor is confined to just the base of the tongue. So it doesn't look like it's going into the lateral portions of the patient's throat. So it doesn't look like it's going into these areas. So when I made that cut and I saw this whitish area, most likely that's gonna be tonsil tissue. So what I did during this procedure was, okay, that's kind of close to the tumor. Why don't I go further out? Why don't I go out to where I know there's tonsil and I know that's normal tonsil and see what that cuts like. And I'm looking at the way this cautery, this is the electrocautery that we're using for making these cuts. I'm looking at the way it's cutting and it looks kind of funny. It still looks very, very funny. But based on the scans, I know that there's no cancer here. And I know I'm afraid. And the question is, well, why do I keep seeing these whitish areas that look a little strange even to me after having done this a bunch of different times? Why is it bubbling and charring so much? Well, actually it turns out that in this particular case, that electrocautery was set a little bit too high. And basically what I've done here is I've cut deliberately into this tonsil 
And since this known tonsil tissue that's not cancerous looks like this area that looked worrisome, we probably are clear here as well, and the tumor is confined to this area at the base of the tongue that the PET scan was in. It didn't grow between the time we got that scan and this patient came to the operating room. So these are kind of the thoughts that a surgeon has um, as they are going through these types of procedures. So we said recognition requires information, but it requires a lot of context. And, you know, I can tell you that we looked at this car, for example, and I said, hey, you know, this is an expensive car. Everybody recognized that. But what if I changed the story a little bit? And I said, hey, look, instead of a car, we're actually talking about highway markings and how they differ among different countries. And you might notice that this middle median line is white. And in Europe, most countries in Europe, that's kind of how they mark their roads. In North and South America, the middle uh, lanes are usually indicated in yellow. Same thing in Norway too, by the way. So it turns out that in Europe, like in Germany, England, these middle lane markings are white. So we may get into a discussion if we were talking about how different countries mark their uh, roads and highways, you know, you would really would not be paying attention to the car, you'd be paying attention to those lane markings. And that's kind of how we switch context back and forth uh, based on abstractions that we have in our head. Countries, lane markings, expensive cars. But what about information? We talked about information, and I think that better information is always good. If you have better information on the tumor location, you can always make better decisions, even with context. And, you know, people have talked about fluorescent surgery for a while now, and the reason why fluorescent surgery is so attractive for cancer surgery is because it's a very optical it's a very hands-on type of uh, endeavor, right? So we're looking, we're cutting, we're seeing things. And optical imaging, which is what fluorescence is, really, really uh, flows naturally with the workflow that a surgeon has in the operating room. Um, but you can say that fluorescence is not really enough. So here's a microscopic image of a head and neck cancer. And you sort of see this outline, these dashed lines outline the borders of the tumor based on the, on the pathology, on the pathologist marking the borders of this cancer. And you can see that the, the fluorescence, this is a fluorescent image of the same exact cancer. You can see that the red areas and the greenish areas, which are fluorescent, um, do sort of recapitulate that border. Um, and then the blue areas are darker, are supposed to be darker. And, and those blue areas are in, kind of in the normal areas of the, uh, of the tissue. But really looking at this, I don't really get a lot of information on where this tumor is. You really want something like this where it's very, very clear and the borders are very, very sharp so I can actually cut around that, right? So I can make a, a cut around this and remove this more precisely. And so that gets into the question of what exactly is information. And I want to talk about Claude Shannon for a little bit because he's the, the father of information theory. And he wrote a paper back in 1948 and it was called the Mathematical Theory of Communication. It was very, very influential. This was the, essentially the paper that started information science and information theory. And this is a, just to give you an idea of how big this paper was, um, it's been cited over 80,000 times. And, you know, Watson and Crick's uh, DNA paper, for example, where they revealed the structure of DNA, which is cited as one of the, which is one of the most influential papers, has only been cited about 30 or 40,000 times. So, this is a very, very big deal. And basically he defined information in mathematical terms. And he said, information is the resolution of uncertainty. And it's transmitted through a channel. And this was his formula for information. So H is the bits of information in Shannon's uh, information theory. And he called this Shannon entropy. And it's basically related to the probability of events. So PI is the probability of something happening. And it, uh, and in this case, he was talking about messages. So he was talking about, you know, you're going to receive a message on a, on, an, you know, on, a, on a secure line, and it's just discrete units. So it's like, you know, Morse code, for example, or it could be A's and B's and C's, or it could be letters or numbers or some combination of those. And the question is, what's the probability of something, of a, of a letter, for example, being transmitted across that line? Well, if it's an A, it's those are pretty common. If it's an X or a Z, those are less common. And that probability tells you how much information you need to resolve that uncertainty. So if P is one, where you're 100% certain of something happening, you really don't need any information to resolve that, okay? Um, the flip of a coin where this is 0.5 or 
you need one bit of information to resolve that. And, and he showed that basically this, this bits, we call them bits of information, um, relate to the probability of something. So the less probable something is, the more uncertain something is, the more information we need to resolve that uncertainty. So in my world, what that means is um, the less likely there's cancer someplace, I need more information to really figure out if there is cancer. Um, whereas if I know for sure a person has a cancer in a given spot, I don't need any information. I don't need to do more scans. I don't need to do more biopsies. I already know that that's, that's, that's where the tumor is. Um, and how are messages transmitted? So this is kind of how it works. So if you have a message that is these little boxes, so you have, you know, white, black, white, black, and that's your message. You transmit that over a, a channel. The channel adds some noise to it, and it always happens, any channel, any transmission, whether it's lights or x-rays or anything, you add noise, and then you have an output. And this output hopefully gives you an idea of what the original message was. In this case, it sort of does, but you see how the noise has altered these you know, white and black dots. It's, it's turned them into gray. It's made the white dot a little bit darker, the black dot a little bit lighter, and it makes it a little bit harder to distinguish but you can still distinguish this original message in the output. Um, but the interesting thing is that surgery is digital. It's binary. We either cut something out or we don't. We don't do anything in between. There's no in-betweens. In cancer surgery, we either remove or we leave. And biology, on the other hand, is not. Biolo biology is more analog. It's more squishy. So uh, what's that difference? I mean, what is the difference between analog signals and digital signals? Um, well, analog is like your AM radio. So the signal degrades if you're further away from the antenna. Um, it's like a sound wave. The further out you are, the fainter it gets. If there's background noise, if there's background uh, 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 signals, it can interfere with that. And so it's subject to distortion, degradation. And when you amplify it or copy it, it can get degraded. So if you have a message like this that's a continuous signal, where everything's kind of grayscale, there's no discrete values, you add some noise to it, you may end up with a final message that's very, very garbled. On the other hand, if you have the message that we were talking about earlier, and you copy this or you transmit it, you end up with a message that's still discernible at the end. And this is analogous to songs in your iPhone. You can copy it or amplify it and transmit it millions and millions of times. Every time you do it, you get a message that's discernible and you can clean up that message and say, okay, we're gonna revert back to the original message, which was you know this white box, black box, white box, black box. And for imaging, it sort of looks like this. So ignore the fact that each one of these cells corresponds to a pixel in an image, but each one of these green cells is a normal cell, let's just say, and each one of these gray things is a cancer cell. So four cancer cells surrounded by all of these other cells. Um, you can transform this into a fluorescent signal or a PET signal. That's what we do with imaging. And then you capture an image of that, a picture of, of, that, of that signal. And we can convert that into these boxes to represent that picture. And when you transmit that signal, the worst case is you end up with something like this that you can still interpret. And you can tell the difference between which one of these pixels corresponds to a cancer cell and which one corresponds to a normal cell. On the other hand, if you have an analog signal, which is continuous, you end up with something like this. Kind of grayscale. It was like that image that I showed you with the fluorescence. You're not quite sure where things begin and end. And when you transmit the signal, even if you don't add much noise, which I didn't in this case, you end up with this, which is not quite as good of a signal as this first case. So where, where does that leave us? So we sort of thought about this and talked about all of these things before embarking upon fluorescent surgery or image-guided surgery, basically what we want is high specificity where we don't want a lot of background noise. We want every fluorescent little dot that we show correspond to cancer. And we don't want any false positives. We don't want anything fluorescing that's not cancer. And we also want high sensitivity, right? So we don't want to miss any. We don't want to have any cancer that is not lighting up, that is not fluorescent. And we want to minimize this distortion. And hopefully we can come up with something that works for all cancer, a universal probe, not just for head and neck cancer, which is what I do, but for other types of cancer as well, because this, this comes up with all, all sorts of cancers. So we set, to, set out to do this. So this was Dr. Gao in the lab. Uh, he's a polymer chemist and he was doing his polymer chemistry stuff, but we, we needed to understand a little bit of physiology first. 
And it turns out that there is a universal signal that we could exploit. So tumors actually use a lot of glucose, and that's why PET scans work. They take up a lot of sugar, they take up a lot of glucose, and they produce a lot of lactic acid, which makes their surrounding environment very, very acidic compared to the normal you know, pH or the normal acidity of blood. So you know, pH is a very tightly controlled uh, physiologic parameter. So normal blood pH is about 7.4, very, very neutral. But these tumors are at a pH that's much, much lower than that, 6.8, sometimes even lower. And the question is, okay, can we exploit this difference? It's a very small difference, but it's very real and it's very, very persistent. And it cuts across all different cancer types. It's true for breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, and of course, head and neck cancer and brain cancers and all sorts of other cancers as well. My main interest, head and neck cancer, definitely falls into this category. Um, and there are pH probes out there. So there are molecular pH sensors that will change color. I mean, you probably have them if you have a fish tank you can you know, take the water and test the pH, or you could do this for your pool if you have a swimming pool. And these things will respond with different colors to different levels of acidity. And you'll, you can see this little curve here. But we talked about analog signals. That's an analog signal, right? It's a continuous signal. If I amplify this, it'll get degraded. If I transmit it, it will get degraded. What we really want is something like this that's very, very sharp. We want a discrete signal. We want to turn it on when there's cancer, and we want to turn it off when there is no cancer. So these are little vials here. You can see the little fluorescence in the vial fades as the pH changes. But we don't want that. We want these vials to stay on. We want these vials to be fluorescent. And when you get to a point where you're not interested in the pH and you get to that threshold or cutoff value or whatever it is, the vials are completely dark. And that's kind of what Jim Ming and his team did in the lab. So we, we basically created a library of these polymer nanoprobes that respond to pH and we, and we could tune them so we could actually have them uh, respond to pH at different values. You know, you see the little scale bar, bar up here and they turn themselves on and off depending on which value you're interested. And not only that, you can actually use different dyes. You can use different fluorescent dyes and make them any color you want, which was very helpful too. Um, and you can get this very, very pretty image that kind of demonstrates that library of polymers that, 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 that we created. So the strategy is this. We inject these probes, this polymer, um, into the patient. We give it intravenously. And it's these little dark balls in circulation. So they're off. There's no fluorescence. This is the pH of the blood, 7.4. They get to the cancer, the cancer is acidic, and they turn themselves on. And hopefully we can see that fluorescence. And hopefully we can detect that fluorescence with some sort of camera. And that's kind of what we showed in mice. Um, if you look at these mice, these all have head and neck cancers. And I actually ended up doing a whole bunch of surgeries on a whole bunch of different mice to, to you know, write about this. But essentially you can see the near IR image. This is the fluorescent image. This is a camera that captures this near infrared fluorescence from this cancer and you can see it glowing. And this is our probe right here. We called it the pins probe at the time. And that's why, you know, it says pins in this, in this row here. And you can see that that tumor is glowing very nicely. And we compared it to other fluorescent probes that you would expect to light up that cancer. So this is 2DG, this is a glucose analog. It's, it's very much like that PET scan that I showed you where the tumor was glowing orange. And we conjugated that to a, a fluorescent dye. And you see some fluorescence here in the, in the neck of this mouse, but not much. And then this is another um, you know, dye. This is the same exact dye, 800CW, the, the near IR dye or the near infrared dye. But now it's targeting a protein that's found on head and neck tumors. And once again, you sort of see some fluorescence there, but not much. And when you look at these under the microscope, this is what our pathologist drew as the borders of these cancers, the dotted, the, the dashed line. Um, these are the cancers. And you can sort of see that the red and green fluorescence recapitulates the borders of those tumors for each one of these cases, right? And the blue is kind of the dark background, the normal tissue that, that we don't want to remove. Um, but you can sort of see that this border is much, much crisper than these other borders. And this would be a lot easier to remove than these other images to cut around. Like if you just took some scissors and tried to cut this out, this would be a lot easier. And actually we wrote a very, very simple image recognition algorithm. So this was one of my um, high school students. So he was a student at the um, Dallas uh, Talented and Gifted Magnet School in South Dallas. And he actually joined our lab for a few months and he wrote an image recognition algorithm 
Um, and the purple line represents what the image recognition algorithm predicts is the borders of the cancer. And you can sort of see that this line is much, much more accurate than these other lines that the algorithm tried to draw. So the algorithm was not so good at deciding where the tumor margins were, um, but when you give it a digital probe, which gives you this on-off signal, it is very, very good at capitulating that border. Um, so it's not just humans that find the, the, the top row easier to, to remove and, and deal with. Um, and so we took that polymer and we actually used uh, them in, in a human trial. So we did a phase one clinical trial in the Netherlands. And this is one of the patients from that trial. So this is a patient with a tongue cancer. You can see their teeth here. And this orange reddish glowing area is the patient's cancer. So we injected this intravenously into the patient, the particles, the nanoprobes, and it goes through the cancer and gets activated based on the acidic environments uh, in that tongue cancer. And when the surgeon pulls the tongue over to the other side and, and shows you the opposite side of the tongue, there's no cancer here. You can see that that area is very, very dark. It gives you that blue background. And that's exactly what you would expect to see and want to see in normal tissues. And you can flip this back and forth and see the, the contrast between those two sides. And this is exactly how this works. We call this a pH nanotransistor because it's analogous to the switches or transistors in your computer or your phone where things turn off or on. In this case, not based on electrical currents, but based on pH. So when it gets to that acidic cancer pH, turns itself on and becomes fluorescent. And when it's not in that environment, it's off. And under an electron microscope, what you see is these little nanoparticles are intact at normal pH. And when they get to the lower acidic pH, they fall apart and they disappear, releasing that fluorescence. And that was the whole idea. And we demonstrated that in a phase one trial. Um, so currently, after that phase one trial was finished, um, we started a phase two trial. And this is some of the data that I can show you from that. And we're actually doing this trial here at UT Southwestern. I'm not involved with this um, because of my conflicts of interest. I can't be involved with a clinical trial, but some of our urologists are trying this out in prostate cancers. And this is a patient with a prostate cancer. And you can sort of see here where the urologist has cut very, very close to this area in the, in the posterior of the prostate. And you see this area of fluorescence. And this is, you know, once again, robotic surgery. And when you superimpose these images on top of one another, you can see that the area that's fluorescent is kind of suspicious. It looks like the, the surgeon may have cut a little bit too close to that area. So the fluorescence is actually providing that surgeon with information that, hey, maybe you need to you know, go back and, and check and make sure that you didn't leave any, any, any tumor behind. And when they did that, you can sort of see here, here's the, here's the prostate, the cut edge, and on white light, it doesn't look that impressive. So this area is the prostate, and this is kind of the tumor bed where the prostate was sitting. And when you look at it under the, under the fluorescence, you can sort of see that the prostate has some fluorescence in it. But there's this spot here that's in the normal tissues that looks very fluorescent as well. So we went back and you know, removed this area and actually that turned out to be cancer. And it was basically cued to, you know, the surgeon cued off of the fact that there was fluorescence on this cut edge of the prostate and knew to go back and look at that area more closely and, and notice this area of fluorescence. So, so there is scope for adding information to current surgery, surgical practice, and combining these images gives you that context. Where is that fluorescence? Where is it coming from? Is it suspicious? Is it worrisome? Is it something that we need to take into account? So I'm just gonna wrap up here, but basically what we've shown is that we can take a digital signal and generate that by using um, some polymer chemistry. And I won't get into the, the chemistry of that because um, you know, that's, that's really not my wheelhouse, but it requires macromolecular cooperativity. So these are very, very complicated interactions between multiple different polymers. And that's what's giving that transistor-like behavior, that on-off behavior. And encoding that and turning the, the tumor location into this digital signal really gives the surgeon valuable information even with the context, even with the information they already have, I think this is gonna be a game changer as far as giving them even more information on where the tumor is and, and, and is located. Um, and it makes this recognition a lot easier, the cancer recognition a lot easier for, for cancer surgeons. Um, and some of the things that we're thinking about going forward are new inputs. You know, we're talking about pH as an input and fluorescence as an output, but you can imagine you can have other physiologic inputs as well and different outputs as well, like, you know, PET, 
signaling or, or other types of signals that we can detect or, or delivery of therapeutics. And of course, we're thinking about new agents um, to do some of these things. Um, I won't talk about this too much, but this is a very, very long journey. I kind of glossed over a lot of it from kind of the idea phase to the phase two human trial phase. There's a lot of discovery in science and building of teams and preparation for public use that goes into this. And there's a lot of people that are involved with this on the basic, you know, basic science side, on the basic research team side, um, starting with, you know, Jin Ming and his lab, um, but then also the clinical research team. So this involves a lot of people with expertise in manufacturing and um, clinical trials and regulatory stuff, uh, dealing with the FDA, you know, on and on and on. So it's a very, very complicated, big endeavor, much, much bigger than, than anything I can, you know, talk about in 20 minutes or so. Um, with that, I'm going to stop. I think I went on for way too long and answer any questions that may have come up. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumer. That was amazing and super interesting. Um, before we move on to your questions, um, we are going to have our colleague, Dr. Claire Aldridge, um, who is our head of our UT Southwestern Office of Technology Development, just jump on for a second and tell us a little bit about how this project kind of relates to some of the work we're doing with her team. Thank you, Corey. Yes, um, I'm Claire Aldridge and I head up the, the office that's responsible for trying to understand the different discoveries that are found at UT Southwestern by our scientists and our clinicians. And then what do we do to translate those into things that can actually impact patient care outcomes and improve health. And uh, this, uh, this project, this collaboration between Dr. Sumer and Dr. Gao is one of the really cool projects because it was really driven by that collaboration between a clinician and a researcher. And the clinician came to the researcher with the problem in his clinical practice, and then they worked together to come up with a solution. And our office helps with um, protecting that intellectual property, whether we need to, to file a patent or a copyright or the trade secret. But then also, how do we um, start to look at what the market is? How big is the market? What is the path? Um, to get something into the market. How do you work with the FDA? How do you manufacture things in a way that you're allowed to put them in to people? How do you collaborate with that, um, you know, the, the commercial entities that have the ability to actually get something adopted by, by clinicians to actually change patient health? And so our job uh, in the office is to do this across the breadth of all the research that's happening at UT Southwestern. And so we have such a great opportunity to uh, work with people like Dr. Sumer and take his science and help get it into the clinic. Thank you, Claire. We appreciate you talking a little bit about that. Um, we're gonna move on now to questions. Don't forget to please put them in the chat box and we'll go ahead and call on you. Um, our first question comes from Grace. Grace, you had a question for Dr. Sumer. Uh, thank you, Corey. Uh, Dr. Sumer, from the pictures, it was kind of hard to tell, but does the tumor actually glow in such a way that when you put, kind of like in the, kind of like the, the principle of a black light, so that like you put a light on it during surgery and then it makes the tumor fluoresce while you're actually doing surgery? And if so, what is that technology? Yes, that's exactly what it is. And uh, the technology is, is, is essentially a near infrared camera. Um, and you need two components for that. You need to be able to detect the near infrared light that is coming from that particular um, fluorescent probe. Uh, and then you also have to have an ex excitation light in, that, in, the, in the specific wavelength that excites that particular dye. Um, you know, luckily, a lot of camera companies, including Da Vinci Intuitive, but to, you know, pretty much every camera company that we deal with as surgeons has a near infrared um, camera that they built for clinical use that, that, that is FDA approved. And the reason for that is that the, the dye that we incorporated into our particular polymer is something called endocyanine green. And this was FDA approved back in the 1940s. And it's a near infrared dye. And, and you know, people use it for, uh, for looking at blood flow. So if you inject endocyanine green into a patient uh, intravenously, it can show you where blood goes. So it's useful for lo looking at vascularity, for example. And, and it's been used for decades for that purpose. Um, in our particular case, we incorporated it into our nanoparticles 
so that we can use it for tumor detection. And, and we deliberately used endocyanine green because number one, it was FDA approved and it's very, very safe. But more importantly, we knew that as soon as we hit the clinics, we can, we, we had this ready supply of cameras that it would be compatible. With. Otherwise, you know, we're not camera people. I don't know how to, I wouldn't even know where to begin to build a camera. So uh, we wanted to piggyback off of existing infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Ron Tosic. Ron, you had a question for Dr. Sumer? Hi, uh, actually, this is uh, Kim Orth, Ron Tausig's wife. I was wondering, <laughs> um, it was a beautiful talk, and you are such a good speaker to explain what you do. I was wondering, um, how deep in the tissue can you see? So do you have to be right at the tumor, or uh, you explain? <laughs> um, that's a great question, and the short answer is it depends on the, on the wavelength of the fluorescent dye. So I'm actually like an amateur photographer. I like taking pictures of birds which is really, really hard because birds, the last thing they want is to have their picture taken um, and they will not let humans get close to them, but it's really worth the effort if, you can, if you're interested in that because it's a lot of fun and you get to learn a lot about birds, but um, it, it, it depends on the wavelength of light. And, and so different wavelengths of light can penetrate deeper into tissues. And that's yet another reason we picked ICG, endocyanin green, because it's a near infrared dye and near infrared light can penetrate up to about a centimeter through tissue. So you can actually see through tissue and, and not just see the stuff on the surface. Um, and so that gives you an opportunity to, to look deeper into tissue and see things that you don't see on the surface. Uh, but, but if we used a different dye, like a, a shorter wavelength dye that's blue, for example, that wouldn't be possible. So uh, it really depends on the, on the dye that you use. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from our good friend, Stu Ravnick. Stu, do you have a question? My gosh, I have so many questions. This is just so cool. Um, Mike, where, where should I start? I think I asked like 27 different questions, but- Why don't um, you pick your favorite question to start with? My favorite question is uh, similar to Dr. Orth, who actually happens to be one of our UT Southwestern uh, fantastic scientists and, science and National Academy members. But uh, Dr. Sumer, can you actually combine the fluorescence imaging technology with the surgery in real time? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the goal from the get-go. And, and that's exactly what we have seen in the phase one and the phase two trial. So you know, with, the, uh, with the Da Vinci robot, I do a lot of robotic surgery. And, um, you know, they, they actually picked a great name for their company because many of the controls are intuitive. And, and you sit down at the console and essentially switching back and forth between the normal view that the surgeon has and this fluorescent view is literally the flick of a switch. So you're just be, you'll, you'll be looking at, you know, the prostate or, or the tumor and you flick a switch and it goes into this green light mode and then you can flick it again and you go back to the white light mode. And it's like a video game. I mean, it's, it's a video, it's real time. It's not a still image. It's a, it's a, it's a video image of what you're looking at. So it's, you know, it's very, very useful from that perspective. Well, that's so cool. Thank you so much. Great. Our next question comes from Mendy. Mendy, you have a question for Dr. Sumer? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Sumer. I wanted to ask if this technology is being used specifically for certain types of cancer right now, or if it's broadly going to be available for other types as well, in general. So in mice, at least, we tried it out in almost 20 different cancers and it worked in every single one of them. So I really think that is broadly applicable. So we've tried prostate and breast and, you know, all sorts of cancers. But in humans, um, so far we've tried it in uh, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, colorectal, esophageal, head and neck, uh, and prostate. And I'm probably missing something, but, but we've tried it in a bunch of different cancers. And we do feel that even in humans, it's going to be universal. Um, so yeah, I think eventually I'd like to see it used for all sorts of different you know, tumors and cancers. And I've talked to a lot of my surgeon friends in different fields and they're all pretty excited. Everyone has their own, you know, pet cancer that they want to try it out in. So I have a, a buddy of mine who's a neurosurgeon um, and at, at UPenn. He wants to try it out for gliomas, for example. So um, I, I think it's going to be widely applicable. 
Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Carol Cropper. Carol, you have a question? Oop, you're muted still, Carol. Hi, I know. Um, I, I, I think it's actually already been asked. I was going to ask whether you can just look at the tissue and see the fluorescence, but I think we've kind of been told that. And thank you. Yeah, yeah, you can. And um, the, the fluorescent features can tell you a little bit. I mean, there's some subtleties to it that I didn't get into, but um, if it's deeper in the tissue, you get this kind of glowing phantom effect. So you can actually use visual cues and context once again um, to figure out what the fluorescence means. And it looks slightly different after watched a bunch of these cases. It looks slightly different when the fluorescence is coming from the surface uh, compared to when it's coming from deeper in the tissue. So the surgeon can actually tell is have I cut into the tumor accidentally or is the fluorescence okay? I'm, I'm kind of still far away from the fluorescence. You can even tell differences like that. And, and once again, it, it, it's based on context. I mean, humans are really, really good at picking up on visual cues and figuring out what it means and interpreting. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Jennifer Pham. Jennifer, you got a question? Hi, I'm currently um, doing research in um, pancreatic cancer, which has a very dense stromal barrier that a lot of times have prevented um, the penetration of chemotherapy. Uh, have you tested the technology of using fluorescence in those types of cancers with a dense stromal barrier? Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. So you get this really uh, significant desmoplastic reaction with pancreatic cancer, and, and that's been a barrier um, you know, pancreatic cancer for a lot of different therapeutics. We have tried it in preclinical models. So in mice, at least, the pancreatic cancer models, it works really, really well. Um, we have not tried it in, in patients. So we have not tried it in, in, in clinical trials and human trials yet. So um, that's that we really, really want to look into. And I've talked to Herb Zay, who's a pancreatic surgeon at UT Southwestern, about that. And he's kind of really wanting to do that and try it for, for some of his patients. Thank you, that was a great question. Our next question comes from Amy. Amy Hollingsworth, you had a question? Yeah, so mine is just kind of coming off of Mindy's the different types of cancer, and that's really interesting how many different ones that you can go across. So once kind of on top of that, is there a specific time that you wouldn't use this on a patient, or will this just be broadly across any patient um, with that type of cancer? Um, I think the only time that I wouldn't necessarily use it is when the tumor is small enough that the visual cues and the, and the usual surgery that we typically do would be very, um, very easy or, or, you know, it, it wouldn't benefit essentially from the, from the fluorescence. Um, the other times that I think that you may not necessarily rely on something like this is when you're doing anatomic surgery versus tumor-based surgery. So in my mind, um, cancer surgery is divided into two large groups. There's kind of like the anatomic surgery that people do, uh, where essentially you know the patient's anatomy, and based on where the tumor is, you take out a certain anatomic structure. So, for example, you know my wife is a colorectal surgeon, and if you have a colon cancer, they don't just take out the little tumor; they actually take out your entire colon or or part of your colon, and that's just the operation. And it's based on the the blood supply to the colon and and the anatomy of the colon, and so the margins are typically not an issue for that kind of a procedure. You know, you, you're usually miles away from where the cancer is. Um, and, and patients um, recur or fail that therapy, not because of the, the surgical margin, but mainly because they have disease elsewhere that's just not detected. It may be microscopic cells in the liver, for example. So I think for anatomic cancer surgery like that, it's probably not gonna be as relevant. Um, but for tumor-based surgery, so this is where you're following the cancer and not the anatomy, I think it will be valuable. And, and those tumor-based surgeries are things like what I do, head and neck cancer, where we want to preserve all the normal tissue. So each surgery is different. Each, each surgery is bespoke surgery, so to speak. Um, glioma is another good example of that. So with brain tumors, um, they just follow where the cancer is going as best as they can, and they try to leave all the normal structures intact. You don't do a hemi brain resection. You don't take out half the brain, for example. It's just not done. So I think the, you know, distinguishing between those two types of cancer surgery is important. 
Great. And then our next question comes from Hangzhou. Hangzhou, you had a question for Dr. Sumer? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumer. It's this wonderful talk. I have a question. I wonder where, uh, do you think, how do you think your technology would work for tumors residing in uh, heart tissue, mineralized tissue, such as osteosarcoma or any um, breast cancer um, or, or breast cancer metastasized to bone or null bone like aminoblastoma, this kind of tissues, uh, tumors are surrounded by mineralized tissue. Do you think that t this technology would work for that kind of situation? That's a great question. And I would have said no, um, except we did a dog patient trial in Arizona a couple of years ago. So this was a, a tertiary care dog hospital where, where, you know, basically people bring in their, their, their pets. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting because I'd never been to a dog emergency room before, but they don't follow HIPAA rules. All, all the dog's names were written on this big board where anyone could read them. Um, you know, so they weren't anonymous or anything like that. So you could see what was going on. But, but there we actually had a whole bunch of dogs that had osteosarcomas. And we tried this out on, on those dogs and it actually did fluoresce. It wasn't very bright, I, I'll say, but it did work. And for osteosarcoma, at least, that's a very important consideration because the margins are critical. Um, ameloblastoma, it's not quite a cancer. It's more of a benign thing. And it's pretty not sure I've never tried it, but it's very, very aggressive locally. So I don't even know if that would be, I don't know if the ameloblastoma has a, has a local pH, uh, tumor pH. That would be a very interesting question. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to close out with one final question um, from uh, my co-host, Jenny King. Jenny, um, do you want to go ahead and ask Dr. Sumer your question? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumer. So I know that you touched on this a little bit, and so did Dr. Claire Aldridge, but could you just speak a little more about funding for ideas like yours of lighting up cancer? And also, could you speak about secret funding and how it has supported you and what it is? Yeah, so um, CPRIT is the Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas. So this was a, this is a state of Texas initiative. It was a big bond that was actually taken to the voters. And it was voted on, uh, I believe, over a decade ago now. Um, and then it was just renewed in November. And it was originally $3 billion and renewed, I think, for another $3 billion. And this has really provided some of the funds for this research. So they actually have a research side of things, which funded some of the research that we talked about in the, in the lab. Um, but they also have a commercialization part to it. Um, so back in 2012, you know, we, we had worked on the project and we had, we had all these ideas, but then the question was, okay, how do we actually translate this to clinical care? And there's this, the, there's this thing called the valley of death that people talk about where you have all these basic science discoveries, but none of them actually get applied clinically. Um, you know, if you look at head and neck cancer, we're using the same drugs from 50 years ago. There's nothing really new. And, and the main reason for that is the valley of death, where you discover things in the lab, but it's very hard to bring them to the clinics to get through all of the FDA regulations, the manufacturing, all the, you know, regulations related to that, the good manufacturing practices you have to follow, um, scaling it up, simplifying it, making sure it's not toxic, doing a phase one trial, a phase two trial, all the, tri all the trials that you have to do and then marketing and sales and all of that. And it became very, very clear that the only way to do that was through a commercial entity, through a company. So, um, so we co-founded that company, Onco Nano, um, and, and basically had them do all that stuff because that's really the way to do it. And Secret was integral to that because Secret actually has a commercialization grant um, that funded some of those early efforts for Onco Nano before they could get private investors interested in some of the technology. So I think you know, that, that's been very, very important. And of course, NIH funding um, through the National Cancer Institute has always been critical to, to fund some of the basic research that we do. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, because I know that we wanna get past that valley of death and, and find new ways to help our patients and we have to have funding for that. So um, thank you for this fantastic conversation tonight. Uh, for your presentation and your deep dive into the science of illuminating cancer.
Flair, thank you for joining us tonight and for all you do in OTD. Uh, Corey, always, you're a great tech guru and a moderator for our Q&A. We appreciate it. But most importantly, all of our guests, we're so grateful that you return with us every other week to learn about science at the UT Southwestern Science Cafe. We are taking a little break for the next month. Um, we're going to be sending you an email tomorrow with a survey about tonight the playlist link again, and uh, we will see you again in a little bit, um, in about a month. Um, but for now, we just want to close out and say, we uh, stay healthy, wear your mask. I have a mask. Um, social distance out there and let's flatten this curve. Um, we hope that you stay healthy and in good spirits and you have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us.